Uh, this is another person in, in the relaxed state, and you'll notice it's a lot flatter type of EEG, not much uh, happening there. And under stress, rather than bringing in, in uh, uh, beta, it's, it's most, mostly slow stuff way down at the bottom here, and some alpha. Uh, this is not an ideal brain pattern, and it shows that this person would be much better off being um, learning how to make more beta at the same time that he's trying to process uh, mathematics. Yes? Stop. Maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with fast Fourier's, and if you explain that as being a uh -huh. two-minute representation of what the mind there does, it's like a frozen average. In two minutes, that's how much activity is thrown out by each part of, you know, it's kind of like flipped version of what we saw earlier. Uh-huh. Flipped average version of the mind mirror, minutes, yes. And then traced on a pen each time. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a good idea, Frank. And, and uh, what Frank was saying was that, that uh, this is a sort of a two-minute sample right here of activity, somewhat like the mind mirror, except the mind mirror is showing it in a vertical array and going out horizontally. This is just showing the two things uh, on a horizontal uh, with the energy in the different bands being shown. As if, if there's a lot of energy, you get a big spike. Okay, this is a very bright crowd in there picking up. Yes, T3 is a left temporal placement, T4 is the right temporal placement. This is another example of a, a very bright person working with uh, math, and you can see again that there's a lot of activity out here in the beta region uh, as, they do, as they do the mathematics. Um, ADD kids um, have been, that instead of producing more beta as their task with math, they pull back and literally go into theta and delta. It's as though they sort of put their brains to sleep when faced with the task of doing mathematics. So people, what we're beginning to find with these brain mappers and, and mind mirrors is that people often produce maladaptive brain patterns that don't serve them well in any given task. And the, the fascinating thing is that they can be trained to overcome that and to produce an optimal pattern. So that's the excitement of what's going on in this area. This is a topograph, and here you have to imagine you're looking straight down on the head. The nose is at the top, so the occipital regions are at the bottom, frontal lobes are at the top. If you notice the frequency bands, what we're looking for here is the effect of a sound light machine, um, which is at, at 10 uh, hertz. And so uh, in the band from 10 to 11, uh, we have some hot activity, which is the reds and the whites and the yellows. The cool stuff is the blue. So since we're using, uh, uh, we're using just, not sound, but we're using just light, uh, we can see that it affects the occipital regions in the bottom, but not in this range from 8 to 9. We see some in 9 to 10 and some in 10 to 11 because the frequency is 10 hertz. Okay, now keep that in mind. Now guess what we're doing here? we're putting in the frequencies at 8 hertz, lit up at 8 hertz, um, and it's gone out at 10 to 11. So the brain is responding uh, very directly to the stimulus, which in this case is a, is a sound light machine. And with these brain mappers, we can, we can change parameters just with keystrokes on a computer, and we can switch these band passes all over the place and look at the data each time Let's see what it looks like when we collapse the bandpass down to one cycle per second. And then we can see if it's really having an effect on the brain. If you had a wider bandpass, you might not see this effect. And with ADD, as Len Oakes has said already, scientists found that light sound stimulation at beta frequencies improved the cognitive functioning of attention deficit disorder hyperactive children. To uncover repressed material, we use biofeedback monitoring, idiomotor signaling, and neural therapy technique. Now, biofeedback monitoring simply means that you can look at the EDR, and it will spring up when something exciting comes along. You can use EMG and certain muscles if people have chronic pain, and uh, it's related back to a childhood incident. That muscle will start to light up as they talk about childhood things. Idiomotor signaling means you can ask the unconscious to move one finger for a yes, another for a no, 
And uh, that's a hypnotic technique that's very useful. Neurotherapy technique is the newest thing. And in this, uh, you're using um, techniques of EEG biofeedback or sound light to take the brain waves down to the point where the critical screening again is not quite so present. Now, here's what they found out, the very new things and the bit of a danger, is that if you, for example, give theta feedback to somebody, what they tend to do is to get below the critical screening and start to access unconscious process. Whatever's in the unconscious might tend to come up at that time. Now, it can make them extremely uncomfortable, then they can go home and they can feel very, very anxious or very, very depressed. So the new thing is to keep a little beta going. If you keep beta frequencies present in the EEG, the beta acts sort of like a kind of a, a sort of a, not a sensor exactly, just a little bit like that, kind of a helpful integrator, kind of like your own therapist sitting there on your shoulder. If anything bad comes up, it says, wait, we can handle it. Wait, wait, we can put it, we can put it in perspective now. We're adults here. That's not so bad as it seems. It's, we can take care of it. So a little bit of beta and EEG is now the thing that people are kind of trying to do. And um, it seems to be very helpful. Sound light audio tape programs, a new thing we're developing uh, for Bob uh, Austin and Synetic Systems. Um, sound light can carry in the change message past the defensive barriers, where sound light is an inner, I consider it kind of like an inner space vehicle, and uh, audio tapes are the change message. Now, we're going to be able to arrange this so that even though you can carry it down to deep levels, you'll also be able to have some beta present so that whatever does come up, if things come up from Pandora's box, they will be able to be handled by your own uh, adult brain. This is the um, compressed spectral array of a person using one of our tapes called Revitalizer. It's a 10-minute tape, and it's in the Tools for Exploration catalog. It just floored us because we did not expect such a good result. And, uh, Essentially what this tape does, it has a hypersync tone on it, and its purpose is to take you from 14 hertz, kind of a busy beta mind, to a nice relaxed 10 hertz, and then down to eight, to a deeply relaxed point, and bring you back to 10 at the last couple of minutes, and leave you off at a nice relaxed 10. And it's got triple voices on it that are saying nice things to you the whole time. And lo and behold, if you look at the spine of the, the mountain range of alpha, you see that it drops down to about 8 hertz and then curves right back in that last minute, right back up to 10 where it's supposed to. So we were very happy to see that, that that uh, simple thing like a binaural tone can often entrain quite nicely brain waves as well. Not as nicely as the uh, sound light, but uh, does a pretty good job. Mind fitness, just one example of some of these new things that are being done in California. This is a salon where you can go in and you can, you can uh, observe alpha waves and, and, the, and what the production of alpha does to your consciousness. And then they get in groups and discuss it afterwards. Now, the next slide is very important. It's the last slide. And I want you to take with you this, this very idea. Who do you think is the real godfather of neurotechnology? Let me give you an idea. Look at there, Bill Gates. <laughs> Wouldn't you know he was the one? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> uh, we got some time for questions. Now, that's a very, a very good remark, very good comment. I'll, I'll uh, go over it uh, because it's very important. Um, uh, the young man was saying that that if sometimes when he makes the tapes in his own voice that he he hears a bit of fear in the voice wonders if that is a very good kind of tape to input during something like that uh, and the the answer is it probably isn't a very good idea to have fear in your voice uh, years ago when we were making our subliminal tapes my wife used to critique all the scripts that I did and if the voice in any way seemed to be a little bit off, a little bit uh, lacking in positive energy, I'd have to do the whole thing over again or she wouldn't approve it. And so we work together to do that. It's very important that whatever tape you, if you can't do it for yourself because you're depressed, you should have someone else do the voice for you and they should do it in a very optimistic, positive, high energy way if possible.